So starting with the person rather than the program. Um, and it's about understanding the person rather than understanding assessments around the person um, or the, the assessment being the lead. So always the person in the center, um, giving genuine choices and involvement in, in decision making, involving family members, friends, sort of full partners, and reflecting a person's capacities and what's important to them, focusing on choice and a shared commitment and listening to the person. So that's just some idea. It is holistic, joined up problem solving approach that supports people to have uh, the lives that they want. It assumes everyone has gifts and talents and can make a contribution. And it explores what's important to a person from their own perspective, what's important for them to keep healthy and safe, and what needs to happen to enable the person to make changes that lead to their best in life. This is an alternative to the traditional types of planning, which are based on the medical models of disability, which is set up to assess need, allocate services, and make decisions for people rather than with them. Okay. So <clears throat> most people all know a lot of this by now. <laughs> so, um, Control doesn't support, connect, or, or promote independence in people. The person is at the center, and we need to make sure the person has control. So what does that mean in terms of autism? We need to think about what having control of the, over your life means if you have the difficulties around autism. So thinking about essential lifestyle elements, um, which all of us, impact on all of us actually um, where we do things how we do them what things we do and with whom we do them it says which whom it should say with whom we do them um, thinking about the essential elements regarding significant people in our lives and who can support us in what we do and then thinking also about clinical elements and and impacts from any particular characteristics or particular um, essential components of an individual that may have impact. And also how we work toward handing over that control to the individual. So that again, for a lot of places, a lot of countries, I think still will be quite a shift. And in a lot of care practices it's, and care cultures, the shift is about handing over the control to the individual and how we go about doing that and why we would do that. Why would we do that? It's probably easier sometimes just to take control, isn't it? <laughs> so in terms of thinking about autism, um, how safe is it for us to give up and hand over control? So at the bottom of the slide here, I've just put a little rider um, that's associated with autism spectrum conditions and maybe the questions that people might ask you know which hopefully will answer as we go through the modules so um, it's not ex necessarily expecting an answer right now but it may be a useful area for discussion around control and who holds the control and how safe we feel or how unsafe <laughs> we feel about handing that across so <clears throat> Thinking about communication and uh, person-centered language. And in terms of person-centered language, the people are always first. So we start with the person and the labels, if there is a label that comes afterwards, because in actual fact, we label boxes and we label jars, we don't label people. Um, and I, I, I can remember one, one, one guy that I met who when you asked what his name was, he would say, I'm John, my autistic son. And that's because his mother had always introduced him as this is John, my autistic son. So he believed that his name was John, my autistic son, which is quite sad really, isn't it? So the label was definitely attached to his name. And depending on what language we use, depends on how we shift that control. 
So control doesn't support or connect people or, or promote independence. Control stays with the carer, with the clinician. So we need to use person-centered language that's plain, easily understood and individualized to the person's own method of communication. The person is at the center and the person has the control. So what, the, what does this mean in terms of autism and some of the difficulties around communication that people with autism experience? Language, for instance, we can hear things like, help Jim to take a shower. Now that's the, the person-centered language, help Jim to take a shower. The controlling language is give Jim a shower. And these are the differences that we see as we go through. The difference between saying, I will eat with Jim, as opposed to I will feed Jim. So the difference is doing things with people and not doing things to people. Language needs to be non-clinical, starting at the point of support rather than starting at the point of doing things to people and clinical language. It should focus on the person and it should be free of jargon, <coughs> labels or any judgment. And in terms of autism, again, remember that people with autistic spectrum conditions might have very specific methods of communication. So we need to really think about the communication as an element of how we, how we work with PCP, with people with autism. For instance, a lot of people are better with visual communication. So, so we need to really know what their communication method is and how we're best to, to have dialogue with them. So if we look at traditional planning and we go back a bit in time, um, it begins with assessments and often the assessments highlight the deficits and problems which need fixing. Now, I know that we've developed an, uh, an assessment and ours, of course, is a fantastic assessment that's very positive and tries to draw out the strengths of the individual rather than, than merely drawing out the deficits and, and weaknesses of the individual. We, very much working on what they like, who they like, um, and, and um, their, their, their positive characteristics. Um, the, then we're moving on to looking at establishing goals. Um, now, traditionally, the establishment of goals has been around which are existing programs, what is in place already, and what, what is that program going to give to the person? Rather than the new way we need to think about working is, what does that person need to do in their life? And what sort of program can we develop around that person so that they can achieve what they want to do in their life? So it's a complete shift in the way of thinking and the way of working. And traditionally, the, uh, the planning relies totally on professional judgments in decision making. So multidisciplinary teams who sit around and decide what's best for an individual um, and make judgments about the individual, things that they feel are safe for the individual to do, things that they feel um, are prohibitive for the individual to do. And that, that leads us on to risk taking because that particular traditional model doesn't particularly allow for people to push the boundaries and to take risks with their lives. And of course, professionals will often feel very unsafe about that because if something goes wrong, um, whose who's head's on the block, whose job's on the block if something goes wrong? And I think because professionals need to protect themselves, um, then they, they, they inhibit individual growth in, in the clients or the people that we support because we have to protect ourselves as professionals. In terms of autism, we're looking at a spectrum um, and that's made up of unique individuals who will not easily fit into one size fits all programs. Um, if they're going to develop and grow, then the program needs to be Bit around, uh, developed around them. 
not that you can actually put somebody with autism into a, a preset program and think it's going to work and think it's going to be healthy for that individual. And I think that that's part of the, we have a saying, putting a square peg into a round hole. And because the funding is there for a particular program, then let's make that person fit the program. Well, with autism, that's not going to work. It's like that oil and water thing that they're not so easy to just adapt into many different programs. So thinking about the person-centered approach uh, and the difference there, um, here we use assessments that focus on people's gifts and their strengths. So a much, much more positive approach. And I haven't yet come across anybody with an autistic spectrum condition that there isn't some, some way that there's something to harness, even in the most profound people. They will have likes, dislikes, strengths, and sometimes indeed gifts that we can use. The person-centered approach relies on information from the person, from their family and friends, and from close key professionals. So starting with the person then, um, how can we actually involve this person? How can we have dialogue with that person, even if it's not spoken dialogue? In whatever way that person can communicate, how can we capture that and actually find out more about what's important to that individual? And maybe also taking information from family and friends and people who work with them closely on a day-to-day -day basis. The person-centered approach defines opportunities by what the person wants. And um, I think that's a really important thing is, is not just what they need, because we often work on needs, uh, but the person-centered approach actually develops that into what do they want to do, not what they need to do. Because we always say that a need must be granted, a need must be met. A want need not necessarily be met. The person can still sort of thrive and stay alive if they just get their needs met. But an enhanced life, which all of us want, is that we get our wants met as well as our needs. So the goals are about opportunities to get those things that people want in their lives, into their lives. The person-centered approach supports community-based opportunities and lifestyles. So rather than just using facilities that are there, um, provided as resources, we're looking outside of that box and we're saying, okay, what's out there that we can use? So can we go out of, of our day service or wherever, or school? Can we go out into the community and do that activity? Um, how, how can we develop relationships in the community? For instance, the gym, the swimming pool, the bowling alley, the shops and everything else that encourage um, a more fulfilled lifestyle. And also uses risk assessment as an enabling tool. Coming back to that risk, um, if we have a process for looking at risk and considering risk, we're more actually likely to take risk. It's more likely that it will enable us to take risk than it will be to stop risks being taken if it's done properly. So um, risk taking is a, a, a very important part of this. Thinking about the autism perspective, how much of support programs we are, are all about protection rather than enabling? So no, we can't, we can't go out and do this because this person has a problem with the road or this person may have behaviours that look a bit weird in public, so we have to keep them shut away and indoors. 